Good day, good day. How are you? Doing fine? Uh, today I'll be talking about a very important uh, topic that is urine diversion. This is very confusing and understand. Just before the exam, we'll go through this video and just go through the few notes. I will be sending you notes. So just put me, give me a, a mail, okay? And I'm ready to help you. So my my request to all of you who are uh, sitting for the NEET exams and all uh, uh, PG exams, pre-PG exams, this urology part is very easy. And all of us, all of you will be aspiring to become urologists. Uh, but but one of the very confusing parts over here is urinary diversion. So radical cystectomy is one of the very important, very uh, very common surgeries being done in neuro oncology for muscle invasive bladder tumors. But again, you know what, the next part, after the, you do the extirpative form or the dissection of the bladder, comes the reconstruction. And herein lies the importance of urinary diversion. There's a, so many forms of urinary diversion, obviously the best of, whenever you have so many forms of urinary diversion, the best form is again yet to be discovered or invented. Okay, so there will be lots of uh, theoretical stuff. You need to just surf through the basic concepts. Okay, my intention today is to put you the basic concepts that will be required during to for sailing you through to the exams. Okay, uh, so if you haven't uh, subscribed my channel, please do subscribe and share it with your friends. So nowadays we're having these WhatsApp groups in our colleges and uh, coaching classes. So please do share my videos and subscribe and like my videos like okay that's my humble request okay so don't without uh, 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 wasting much time i just go to today's discussion now this is urinary diversion as you can see the overview now as you can understand urinary diversion basically diverts the urine from the normal native passage okay now herein lies the crux to the normal conventional definition is that there's another form of urine diversion known which goes by name of orthotopic urinary diversion or to the big new bladder, which actually diverting the unit away from the blood because it is resecting out the bladder into a new bladder. This is a bladder being created from your native intestines and it is joining, you are, you are basically anastomosing it to the urethra, native urethra, okay? So it is again a part of uh, bladder diversion, but it is an orthotopic diversion, okay? Now, what are the indications? Obviously, the most common indication is muscle invasive bladder cancers, but again, there are neurologic conditions as well, especially jejunary tuberculosis causing a thimble bladder, radiation injuries. Post radiation cystitis, but this radiation cystitis is causing severe bleeding, intractable bleeding. Okay, the we use all forms of this and uh, admit the patient, try alarm mitigation, go for angioembolism. Everything phase you have to go for a salvage system. Also, pain, the pain associated with intractable incontinence that are associated with it. Then obviously you have to ultimately go for salvage procedures. Now, patient selection, obviously this is not a um, one surgery suits all sort of thing. That is the, the part of the unit diversion. So obviously you have to tailor it because you have multiple forms of these diversions. You have to tailor it according to the patient's requirement, according to surgeon's expertise, according to the renal function of the patient, okay? It's very important if the patient is have a hepatic disease and renal function disease, you cannot go directly to having a user intestine as a form of conduit, especially so if you, if you are trying to contemplate a continent urinary diversion, that's very important, okay? So in this cases, in this case, if the GFR is below 60 for a continent urinary diversion, or below 45 or 40 something around that for ILL conduit, then you have to see whether it's due to some obstruction. Often there is some obstruction of the malignancy. Uh, then you have to you can't put in a double J stage to the um, uh, to the bicystoscope because often these are blocked, totally blocked. So you have to go for a percutaneous nephrostomy, PCS, bilateral PCS, check the, the creatine levels again, see it's coming down then uh, you can do the procedure. Otherwise, they, they will all fail because now that what you can understand, now, now they have created a, a conduit or a, a system from the, from the intestine, which will function as a passage or a carriage or a storage of urine, which is normally not its habit. So there will be abnormal absorption of solids or substances and they will abnormally metabolize all these metabolic complications. Okay. Now, also this irradiation is also a big issue because often we have patients who have undergone severe form of radiation cystitis with radiation proctitis, radiation enteritis. 
These patients are not very good candidates for this. Uh, ultimately, you can create a small bowel of intestinal or ileal loop on Dewey, but they are not good for the continent pouches or your uh, neoblockers, okay? So that's very important. This is the basic thing of a unit diversion is uh, are the ileal conduit is basically implanting the ureters into a conduit of the intestine it takes out as a stoma outside, okay? And you remove the bladder. This basically tells you the story. Now, what is temporary urinary diversion? Temporary urinary diversion is this like, looks like a suprabic cystostomy. All of us have done SPCs in emergency work, like during our emergency duties. What is when a patient has come, you, you try to put in a catheter. He's a severe agony because the blood is palpable, he's unable to urinate. Try to put in a catheter, you can, that doesn't go. You see, he's suffering from a urethral stricture. Now, what will you do? You put in a SPC, it's, it's, it's the most easiest form of a temporary urinary diversion. Then take the patient for urethroplasty later, um, uh, later after two days, when the patient is straight and optimally, uh, medically optimized. And then after that, you remove the, uh, the space. This is basically a type of temporary diversion. Same thing, when you put a parietal PCNs, parking nephrostomy tubes in a patient, the same thing happens. The, the creatine comes normal, then you take it out. You've done the surgery, okay. Now this is temporary, what is permanent? That is, that is, the, that is the purpose of today's talk. The permanent urine diversion because of surgery to reroute the urine flow to an external pouch, Called the stoma or a surgically created internal reserve. That's the that's the definition. That's what I'm talking about. Is that uh, that, that the continent urine diversion? Uh, that's the uh, autonomic neoblastoma. Now, what are the types of urine diversion? Obviously, I talked about what is the cutaneous, as goes to skin and incontinent. So you have a con cutaneous urethrostomy or an ileal ileal continent, or you have a continent urine diversion with the form of this fancy names like uh, Indiana pouch, pens. What is a continent uh, catheterizable stomas? Or the previous, because when I started my uh, clinical days, my SSC days, I was exposed to unit diversion. The first unit diversion I saw, first few unit, unit, unit diversion I saw was of uterus six. Now it was a it was basically a government hospital with a lot of patients over there. Most of this lower socioeconomic status, they came with bladder cancers. And what did the professors do? They were they resected out the bladder. And they implanted the ureters right into his rectus uh, rectus sigmoid uh, place. So what happens is peeing, peeing, and pooping in the same uh, uh, the same aperture. It's easier for a lower socioeconomic status because it doesn't need to carry a um, compliance around, it doesn't need to do a CIC every hour, every two hours. Whenever he feels the need to pass urine or need to pass stool, he goes to the squats down and just passes whatever he needs to. The problem is there is a lot of mixes, mixing of the stool and the urine, and there's a chance of reflux as well. Somehow, Hemicox later devised a Hemicox pouch, which is with advanced form, creating a, a, a colonic interception to act as a valve like to prevent reflux. But all they failed, which is all they failed. Uterus, though the simplest form of operation, very quick form of operation, they failed because the patients died of metabolic complications before the cancer actually um, make, made him die. Okay, so this is a very important uh, thing. So obviously, the, the, what's the goals of doing a urinary diversion? So it must be non-reflux. As you can understand from uh, uh, till now, must go for non-reflux, okay? Because you are creating a reservoir, which is not accustomed to holding urine. Also, the nerves are not accustomed that you will have a sensation of having to void. Otherwise, what? You can have a sensation to void whenever you are having 200, 300 ml of urine. But the patient doesn't know that he needs to go to bed. This is more common with content catheterostoma or the new bladders. But for a for a conduit, it's basically, basically it's incontinent, isn't it? So it must be a non-refluxing. So it must not reflux. It must not reflux. Whenever it gets enlarged, chance of reflux and causing acute paranephritis. So also the urine is infected. The urine has a lot of, because there's a lot of mucus being produced by the intestines. They all get mixed and it goes above. The kidneys are not, uh, kidneys are not accustomed to having mucus infection, all these things being refluxed to its surface on its face. So it goes into paranephritis and the patient dies. In fact, it goes to sex and the patient dies. So non-refluxing, low pressure, even at high volume, social acceptable. Most try to be non-absorptive, always doesn't happen. And it empties completely and easily catheterizable. That's very important if you have a continent stoma. Right. Now, these are the historical milestones. You can understand ureteros started all with ureteros six, then passed to the ileal, uh, this ileal conduits, and finally to this uh, continent catheterizable pouches, and thanks to um, that, that's the most in the orthotopic neoplasm, orthotopic uh, diversion. Cutaneous ureterostomies 
are the primitive form of urinary diversion still being used today because the easier form because you cannot what you do is that you just take out the ureters and put it in the skin problem is the ureters are not accustomed to being pulled they are accustomed to pay the retropatium now you are pulling a thing pulling a tube stripping it off is mesentery you can't strip it off mesentery too much or the ureters will they close okay so you pull it up you pull it through the abdomen wall rectus muscle skin and all these things whatever you try and the ureters will have a tendency to come back again recoil back so that there's a chance that it will have a recoil for that you need to do so extensive so skin margin the, the stage, there's something called the skin margin uh, plastic surgical with the z flaps the q flaps just to prevent it from slipping down slipping down something called a loop ileus loop uterostomy where you actually keep a one uh, layer you open as a stoma the other layer of the ureter you maintain so there is some <coughs> some amount of urine cycling so the bladder is kept wet they say that a dry bladder just excuse me for a while they say a bladder is supposed to be wet but if you keep the bladder dry for some time because the urine will be diverted then if you are doing a later reconstructive procedure there's less chance of bladder to become functional well function they have a lot of problems after that so that's one of the issues so for child children pediatric patients same thing with psychostomy is incontinent procedure just take out the bladder and outside it's it's as a form of a uh, infra 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 vesical uh, diversion so that was a supra vesical diversion it's infra vesical diversion and this get done in young babies who are not fit for who, whose ureter is not fit for uh, endoscopic resection of the pelvis okay now the most important thing is non continent urinary diversion and this is basically that in the diversion of choice this is the ileal conduit what we use in ileal conduit is you use a 12 to 50 cm loop of ileum 12 to 50 cm from proximal to the ileocecal junction so put in a stent because there is no chance of obstruction at the level of the ureter intestinal anastomosis and also it will help you to monitor the urine output of the post op period that's very important okay so after the surgical procedure skin barrier place a bag and you can all this you also have a stomal therapist together with you working in tandem with the surgical team so the stomal side is marked to prior and on the post operative care is also taken by the stomal because in long term even all this thing the stomal bag will be needs to be changed and stomal barrier needs to be changed a lot of the screens to be placed so that the stomal side is not infected and macerated because there's often there's a urine now uh, the skin is often comes in contact with the urine isn't it so this is the procedure to 10 to 50 cm ileal segment as well 10 to 50 cm proximal ileocecal valve the mesentery you have to keep the mesentery you have to uh, mesentery window is closed uh, the continuity to small bowel is reestablished and you flush the the, the 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 segment of this intestine or uh, small intestine is not because of try to push flush it off all the mucus okay mucus being produced and you fashion it in the as the end ileostomy in the right lower corner we come into the pictures okay this is the, this is the this is the intestine this is the intestinal loop okay you this is the segment of intestine been removed and you are basically you are um, doing the ileo ileostomy this is done by a stapler and this you place down below it and you maintain this mesenteric window okay now this this you you suture to this end and you take it out as a pouch and the ureters you can understand if it because it goes to right lower quadrant the left ureter has to traverse a long way long way to come out so the left ureter has to be mobilized better also it goes below the sigmoid vesicolo the sigmoid colon actually it goes to sigmoid vesicolo this is how what really happens the suture of this end this is the mesentery you have to take it very be careful that the part of the mesentery actually goes out to the pouch and this is the pouched section it goes to rectus muscle organs if you don't go to rectus muscle there's high chance that the, that the condy will come back will recoil will retract and will cause a uh, prolapse okay or other cause a prolapse or retraction or a peristomal hernia so they are very common they are very common so you can see the ureters are now just uh, looks like they like two fingers but now we are planning to do what is known as ureter intestinal anastomosis this is very important this is a very important sense that there are two forms of ureter intestinal anastomosis one is a uh, Uh, refluxing anastomosis one is non refluxing anastomosis brica valis is basically refluxing anastomosis but the other thing the tunnel small bowel lead that split nipple they have to carry this ureters to a segment of the intestine interstitium that is below the mucosa but this this tunnel technique basically don't work in the long term so these are non refluxing but they don't have they cause obstruction right so the, the thing is brica anastomosis is what we actually were looking into 
you just do an end to end to sight, end to sight. You have to intercept anastomosis. This is how you do. Just take, make, take a small pout of intercept out and you make a sutures over here. Okay. And Wallace, well, what does Wallace do? Wallace basically is a, is a frequently used refluxing anastomosis technique, but we actually suture the ends. Either you end, uh, basically, this is basically you suture the end either in a Y fashion or a reverse Y fashion. Okay. And you make it end, either it's an end to, it's coming transversely or just going directly inside. So it's basically end to end anastomosis. The problem with Wallace is whenever, because most of these failures, huh, malignancy, restrictors, malignancy with recurring at, at the lower end of the ureters, that's why you take out the lower end of your central fusion section, occurs the lower end of the ureters. And if one of them being obstructed, Ah, malignancy actually recurrent spreads to other ureters as well. So the, so the malignant spreads to both of the ureters, the obstruction spreads to both of the ureters, and the patient goes to direct renal failure, acute renal failure. But that doesn't happen in the bricker form because it, uh, it obstructs over here. The other ureter is fine. Other ureter is fine. Okay. Then this is the how you used to create the stoma. You do a three point three point sutures actually in the skin, the one part of the intestine and the other, the pouting section. So it pouts so easily. But again, the three-point sutures must not go through the, the mesentery. That's why I will tell you what is the most common cause of hemorrhage in the post-op period, and the stomal, stomal bleeding. Because one of the, because as I, as, I, as I showed you, you know, this is the one part of the mesentery goes inside. If it in, invariably, if you take an inadvertent, inadvertent suturing, inadvertent bite through the mesentery, then it will bleed like hell after you take it. Because at the time of the operation, this is five, six hours, the intestines are kept uh, uh, in, in the open and mesentery is also kept open to the blood. There will may not be bleeding at the time. Later on, there will be bleeding because when everything is fine. Again, you have to take the patient inside your theater and it's really like it to all those blood vessels. It's very important. So the types of classification of the stoma is the flush stoma and the other thing is the protruder. That's the nipple butt, the nipple stoma I will talk about. The other thing is the loop and eyelid, just like a just like the transverse colostoma, you know. The flush stoma is often used when you're using mitrophenops. That is the we'll talk about it. Mitrophenops is the uh, this appendix. We do an appendicectomy. We use a continent a catheterizable. This is the continent catheterable stomas. Use a, a segment of the intestine as a reservoir. You put this in the other way and remove it, and, and basically you have the mesentery intact. So basically, this is acting as a channel, and you can do a CIC. So it's basically acting as a continent mechanism. The, the tip end is actually as an interception. It is, is looking like a valve, and again you can easily pass it, easily, easily pass your CIC catheters. For this, you have to do a flush stoma with all these V-shaped skin flaps. It's called a VQZ stoma plasty. So it looks very nice. Okay, there's a lot of cosmetic issues in this patient. So it looks very, especially for children. It's very common for children, this uh, nimitrophenops. Continent cutaneous urinary diversion is, is again a very complicated issue. Again, I want to tell you is there are people like Cock and people like um, India. I don't know why uh, Indian that doesn't mean Indiana is Indiana Jones. <laughs> yeah, I'm just uh, joking. It's very important that these, these advanced surgeons. What they did is they understood that this is a conduit. You have to create a create a bladder, you create a, a new new bladder sort of thing, because you don't uh, you put a segment of the intestine. It looks like a stage of suppose suppose for example, you have a, a intestine. You create one part of intestine, the other one you try to chimney it inside. Chimney it inside means that the interceptor segment it will come inside that part of uh, reservoir. So whenever the reservoir has a lot of urine, it will act to compress upon the chimney and will create, this will create a, as they say, this will create a valve-like mechanism, a passive valve-like mechanism. Okay, this is the basis of continent cutaneous urine is diversion. You intercepted by staples, you intercept by sutures, but often this fail. And when they fail, they have this uh, stomal prolapse and they will have this reflux and what, whatever, okay. So these are the different, uh, this, uh, this thing that we know of, continent cutaneous reserve wise. There's something, as I said, something is the interceptor, intestinal segment, so act as nipple valve. So whenever there's a lot of uh, urine being stored, it will create a valve-like action on this outlet, okay? And then we have the mitrophenol, we've discussed about it, okay? And the Yagmonti, because the appendix often may be not present because of previous appendix sector, the appendix is pathological, it will be too short to bridge the gap. In that case, you take a small bowel of intestine, uh, small uh, intestine volume, uh, cut it uh, one, one end and then you make it a cigarette like it, roll it in the form of cigarette, huh? roll it in the form of cigarette. That is longitudinally. So you create a longitudinal tip. The adequacy of the channel is maintained in the Yagmonte. 
Same thing, chondrion physicos to be take a bladder flap and you try to intercept this longitudinal length. Okay, bladder flap, longitudinal. You making a cigarette like a cigarette uh, thing, you know, cigarette roll, and lower end you intercept into the bladder. So it creates a creates a passive continuous valve mechanism. Okay, this is these are things. So you get the complication of ischemia, hemorrhage, stenosis, fistula, okay, all these things are these are pictures being taken from the net actually. So stomal ischemia very common, and they often have to revise the stoma. Okay. Stenosis, hemorrhage, we talked about. Then we have this edema. Okay, it takes time, but they, they, they don't need to go for revision. Mucinous separation, peristomal abscess, fistula, these is rapidomies. Uh, stomal retraction, we talked about, prolapse. Okay, these are very important. If you don't take it out to the rectus muscle, this happens. Uh, early complication, most of ileus, bowel obstruction, more common in continent diverse. You can say continent diverse is very, a lot of complications. Leaks, paronephritis, urinoma. Next, we come to the metabolic complications. What happens in the metabolic complications is if you use a stomach segment, there's a chance of metabolic alkalosis because a lot of ions, by H plus ions, the protons been secreted. Okay. That's why you, you use a proton pump inhibitor to treat these patients. Also, a lot of HCL being there, CL is there's a high chance of hyperchloremia. So the patients have metabolic alkalosis, hyperchloremia. Okay. If you use a jejunal segment, the patients are typical, all this, all this intestinal segment except stomach they will have metabolic acidosis, okay? Again, these patients will have vomiting, they have dehydration, they have excess aldosterone secretion secondary to it, and these patients have low serum sodium, but they have increased, because of this aldosterone and all this vomiting and all this sodium channel antiport system not functioning well, they have elevated production. They have hyperkalemia, hyponatremia, and a metabolic acidosis, and a hypochloremia also, because of this recurrent vomiting and all these things, okay? Now, what happens in the iliac and the ileal and colonic segments? It's very important to understand. Is these patients develop metabolic acidosis, but they develop what is known as hypokalemia. They have they have uh, hypokalemia, hyponatremia, hyperchloremia, hypomagnesemia, hypocalcemia. All this absorption is totally be disarray. What really is the problem over here? This this doesn't happen in normally renal renal uh, sufficient patients, but normally there's a renal deficiency, insufficiency. These are highlighted. So whenever you have uh, hypokalemia, deficiency, you will have severe lethargy, also with hyponatremia. Second, hypocalcemia, they have bone problem, bone issues. Then there's a delayed absorption of vitamin B6, vitamin B12, all these things also. And in sepsis, they have a lot of hyperabsorption of ammonia. So these patients will have encephalopathy in the water. Continent reserve, the same thing happens, but to a larger extent, it's magnified because they are continent mechanisms. These, 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 these reservoirs collect urine for a longer time. They are made of the ileum, the same ileum they make the ileal conduits and, and they're taking it for a longer time. So there's a lot of side of infection also, chance of, and also the very important to understand is because creatinine, urinary creatinine in is absorbed because of the long time of dwelling time. So if the patient will have an increased serum creatinine, so to measure serum creatinine, to, me to know whether the patient has a renal failure in the post op is very difficult, it's fallacious. It's just a, to go for acid-based balances, all the same, BG, and everything else, okay? Now this is the neobladder. This is the last thing, the neobladder we talk about. This is the student's neobladder. This is a continent. This is basically, obviously, this is obviously the patient is, uh, is passing urine in his uh, in his own uh, through his native urethra. The, the thing is that they're creating a, they're taking about a fifty centimeter defunctionalized the, the 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 intestine. They're creating this this bowel. This bowel be converted into a new bladder, but they are having a peristaltic afferent loop. Okay of small intestine, it's about 12 centimeter or 12 to 50 centimeter, somebody keeps it 20 centimeter, that's totally a surgical uh, thing. So it prevents, it prevents the reflux. All this, all this uh, interception, these are not in vogue today. You have, this is what they are, they are creating a rounded short sort of, uh, they're using this W, keeping the W and then opening up the, the antipacitic border and trying to make it a rounded reservoir because if the rounded reservoir Laplace says that the pressure generation is less, less chance of reflux, less chance of uh, this, uh, this thing getting burst because you understand they don't have nerves like the normal bladder. So you don't know whether they're having this urination urge or not. They will be totally accommodating. The accommodation happens in a long term, okay, long term affair. So they need to do CICs, also the mucus plugs being produced and they obstruct the urinary passage. So there's a high chance of reflux. 
This reflux is prevented by this isoperistaltic loop of ileum. Where you implant it, where is, but this is by, by the Bricker's process, you implant the ureters. So this is neobladder. This is the latest form of urine diversion we are dealing with. So, okay, that's it. Let me stop my share. So if you have any question, feel free to uh, ask me in the comment section and also feel free to come to my website, www.drpravidbasu.com. I'm just giving you the link to all these things and mail me if you have any questions, okay? Uh, again, once thank you for being with me. It's a pretty long, pretty long um, lecture today, but it found very useful just if you have just before the exams, okay? Bye-bye, please keep, uh, stay, uh, stay. Uh, and you also ask me, you know, whether uh, what, what what the next topic you need to, uh, me to create a lesson for you, okay? So, stay fit and keep healthy.